Good evening. Wow, what a crowd. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. My name is Randy Heiler. I'm fortunate to be part of the Library Foundation and chair of the Spotlight on Science Committee. There's many of us in the room who helped me in uh, finding great speakers like we have this evening. Um, this is our second installment of what is our first full season of Spotlight on Science. It's the latest addition to the Foundation's roster of outstanding programming, which many of you have been to many of the other ones, which brings us together to hear from the world's leading authors, artists, journalists, doctors, scientists, and others on topics of interest and relevance and importance to our community. So uh, before we start, please everybody silence your cell phones and uh, we will have time for questions at the end. Spotlight is one of six programs that the library offers to the community. The Witty Lecture Series showcases distinguished speakers. Library Live brings authors of renown to the library. The Financial Literacy Workshops provide up-to-date information on managing your money and your estate. Medicine in Our Backyard highlights the latest in mental health, I mean, in all health and medical advances. And the Book Discussion Group is a lively conversation on books of great interest and acclaim. The Foundation, importantly, also supports innovative library resources like the Media Lab, the Self-Checkout Computers, the Tech Toys, the Wayfinder, and the eBranch of digital resources, which is why we urge all of you to make a contribution to the Foundation to either renew or join as a new member. We cannot present these pr uh, programs or fund all those other important resources without your support. So as, as most of you can see, uh, we typically fill or exceed the capacity of this room. Uh, it has limited occupancy and sight line and audio problems. Um, so we have accepted the challenge as the foundation to help build and raise 50% of the cost of the state of the art library lecture hall that is being built next door. Um, it's really a civic auditorium and it will be for the entire community, not just for the library. It's now called Witty Hall in recognition of the generous gift by Bill Witte and Keiko Sakamoto, and it truly will be a community-wide asset. So since our first spotlight of the season last fall, we have received the city approvals and held a groundbreaking, which maybe you saw in the newspaper, for the Witte Hall. And that does explain the mess in the parking lot. But while we have raised nearly $8 million already for this effort, we have to raise 12 to meet our 50% of the obligation. So we are still looking to raise another $4 million. So we urge you to join us in making this vision a reality, and there'll be a donation box at the back of the hall. Uh, please also note that this library we're sitting in was similarly funded by a public-private partnership 30 years ago this year, if you can imagine. Um, it was led by the vision of the Starr family, and it was supported by donors like you from our community. So please see our website or our foundation CEO, Jerry Kappel, here in the front, or that donation box in the back to help us invest again in the future of Newport Beach. Okay, so tonight we are very excited to introduce the second of our three presentations on a topic that's pretty much on everyone's mind, artificial intelligence, or AI. Our first session uh, last fall featured Dr. Parik Smith from UCI, who helped us understand what the term AI means when taken in the context of scientific discovery, not for writing nonsense on the internet, and, uh, and how it's uh, helping advance and accelerate our understanding of everything from the human body to our planet to the cosmos. The rest of this season, we'll learn about how AI is supporting our efforts to understand and combat climate change. Tonight's presentation, entitled Tracking Ice and Water in a Changing Climate, features two world-famous glaciologists who have been closely watching our planet's glaciers and ice caps. And our final session, on May 15th, we'll be covering digital tools for projecting coastal erosion and flooding, something of great interest to many of us in the beach communities. So please mark your calendars. Okay, so let's get on with it. Um, doctors Eric Mignot and Isabella Velicogna are both professors in the Department of Earth System Science at UCI and are senior scientists as well at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Both of them are world-renowned glaciologists who study the effects of global climate change, especially on polar ice sheets. 
The research uses satellites to understand the dynamics of glacier ice in Antarctica, Greenland, Alaska, and pa Patagonia, and probably any place else that still has an ice sheet. Dr. Rignot is chair of the Department of Earth System Science at UCI. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and a recipient of the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. His education began in France before he moved to the U.S. to earn his Ph.D. in electrical engineering at USC. He was part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, which you may know received the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize and was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2018. Dr. Renault's research has documented major acceleration of ice loss as a result of climate change and has been widely covered by the news media. Recently, he was featured in the Emmy-winning HBO series Vice, where he discussed Antarctica's melting ice sheets and the global impact of sea level rise. Dr. Velikonia was educated in Trieste, Italy, and moved to the U.S. as a postdoc at the University of Colorado before receiving a joint appointment to JPL and UCI in 2006. Along with Dr. Uno, she was part of the IPCC and was selected as a Kavli Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, representing the nation's brightest young scientists. She was elected a Fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2020, where she has been honored with the Joanne Simpson Medal for her trailblazing research. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Rignot and Velikonia to the library. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming. So I'm a, I'm a glaciologist, so my, my first job is to figure out if ice is melting when it gets warm, if it is raising sea level. Uh, and, and I did that, and the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> my second job is to um, see if we can project what's going to happen uh, in the coming century. And we're working very hard on that, and, and we may fail at doing that, but um, that's part of the story of today. Um, a lot of my work is funded by NASA, and we use satellites, and satellites have completely revolutionized the way we look at polar regions. We knew virtually nothing uh, about the polar regions before uh, satellites. Um, and you see this uh, composite image of Antarctica here. The first mosaic of satellite images of Antarctica was done in year 2000, and this is a map of the flow of the ice in the Antarctic made in 2011 using a whole range of uh, radar satellites, which describe for the first time um, uh, all the ice streams and glaciers draining ice from the continent and how far uh, inland uh, they would drain the ice. So I was fortunate to be there at the right place doing the right thing at the right time when I work at JPL and some of these uh, satellites uh, were launched. And, and um, a lot of other techniques have been added over time to look at the melting of ice in the polar regions to the point that we know today very well what's going on in Greenland and Antarctica, very, very well on a monthly basis. And part of this data that you're showing here um, are obtained from the, the GRACE mission, term, which measures term variable gravity, and, and Isabella is a, a, a lead expert in, in that. And this is combined with some other data, uh, which go back further in time, also based on other types of satellite data, to look at what happened to all the ice uh, on Earth. And um, this is the evolution of the mass of uh, ice in Greenland, Antarctica, and all of the world's glaciers and ice cap with time, the past 40 years. And you see that all these curves are going down with some seasonal cycle. Um, the map at the bottom shows in red the areas that are losing uh, mass over time. So you see that it's affecting all of Greenland and it's affecting some parts of Antarctica. And you see that the curve has, it's not a line, it's, it has some curvature, which means that the mass loss is increasing with time. And if you take that trend over time and extrapolate over the coming century, you get about a meter, meter sea level rise on average uh, uh, on Earth. And a meter of sea level rise is, is a big deal. Um, you have to protect for about three times that, the coastal uh, uh, sectors, if you want to protect yourself from one meter. And the cost of adaptation to a one meter sea level rise is a billion dollars for a city, uh, a large city. It's, it's trillions of dollars for the US and 
I don't know exactly, but several tens of trillions of dollars worldwide to adapt to that. And we are awfully unprepared um, for that. Um, one thing that we learn um, from this satellite data and looking at the evolution of the ice sheets, we're not just measuring mass balance. We want to understand how uh, the ice is, is, is melting away in the system. Um, and, and the major discovery that was made is that it's not proceeding from the surface from just warmer air temperature and more solar radiation. The ocean is a very big part of that system, and the ocean is driven by the winds, by atmospheric circulation. So suddenly we realized the ice sheet is communicating with the rest of the climate system in a very big way. Uh, in the Antarctic, there's warm water in that red circle here. It's found at depth at the surface. It's very cold. It's very cold polar climate. You'll find water, salty water at depth that melts the ice a hundred times faster than it does at the surface. So it's really important for us to um, understand the temperature regime around the Antarctic, same for Greenland, the seafloor depth on how this water can possibly make its way to the glaciers. A lot of these things had never been measured before. Uh, and this is changing as a result of uh, greenhouse gas emission and also the ozone hole. I, I had my uh, um, uh, stepfather-in-law one day, he's not a scientist, who asked me, is there any connection between the loss of ice in Antarctica and the ozone hole? And I thought, oh, that's, that's an interesting question. I never thought about that. And a few years later, a paper came out showing how the loss of the ozone in the Antarctic uh, was, was resulting in a cooling in the stratosphere in Antarctica and contributing to the strengthening of the winds around the Antarctic that tend to push the warm water towards the Antarctic continent. So yes, the ozone hole has an impact on what's happening to the glaciers and the greenhouse gases emission in the rest of the world also make the water um, from the circumpolar current come in contact with the ice sheet uh, uh, in greater quantity. Same thing in Greenland. It's a little bit different in Greenland. The jet stream is wobbling. The Arctic is, is warming at two to three times faster than the global average because of the loss of sea ice, the loss of snow cover. We have also warm water melting the glaciers from, from below a uh, hundred times faster than at, at the surface. So there too, um, we need to know the seafloor depth uh, that leads to the glacier and the water temperature. Uh, some of this work I started with some colleagues uh, about 15 years ago, and when we started, there's almost no data. Uh, the fjord had never been mapped. Um, and we went on to map it, and, and uh, little by little, and then we got a big project, and we mapped them all. So now I'd like to do the same thing in the Antarctic, but it's just seven times bigger, and I need a really big ship. Uh, to do that. So we are not close to that for the Antarctic. And we want to measure ocean temperature. So the, the first time you do that, you go, ha-ha, I found warm water here. That's why this glacier is in peril and retreating fast. But soon after that, you realize I want to do it again and again and again because I want to see how this temperature of the ocean is changing with time. So I need a monitoring system. Uh, today, if you want to measure the world's ocean, you don't use... Uh, well, you use satellites, but the most powerful instrument is the Argo float network. These are robotic floats that go down to the bottom of the ocean and go up, and they make measurements, and when they come to the surface, we transmit the data by satellite to a receiving station. That's how we measure the world's ocean today. We can't do that around the ice sheet because there's a lot of ice around, and it's shallow uh, seafloor. The technology now exists to do that, but uh, it's not been developed and, and implemented at scale, but this is eventually what we need. So I work with NASA, I love NASA. Um, they do science, observations, they do technology to make better science, um, and, and they've been doing that since the inception of the NASA program. NASA is known for space exploration and moon landing. Um, First time I woke up in the middle of the night to watch TV when I was a kid was to see the astronauts on the moon. That was pretty cool to see the astronauts, but also to get up in the middle of the night. And um, the NASA program of observation is, is pretty healthy, and, and we are on the eve of a, of a major uh, growth in uh, satellite observations of the Earth. Uh, I think I have 
some slides here which showed where we were um, about 10 years ago, and we have all these missions, new missions that are lighting up. Uh, NASA budget is the same. They just learn how to do faster, better, and cheaper missions uh, with, with better technology. And this is providing a whole new set of observation of the Earth so we can understand it better, look at more details, and look at it more frequently. Uh, along with that, there's um, an expected growth in the number of data that we're going to be able to access. I was lucky to start my career before this plot was made in 2000 when I was still manipulating data on magnetic tapes and I would always mess up and with the machine and get the tape scratched out and I would order another tape. Now we saw the disk coming up and then you can get the data through FTP and all this stuff is just too big. Even NASA said we don't know how to do uh, the data archive anymore. USGS said, I don't know how to store the Landsat data. And Google said, we can do it for you. Amazon said, we can do it for you at a price. Um, so you see this explosive growth in, in the satellite observations. That's, we're just around the corner from NASA, NOAA, and also a whole commercial sector that's exploding because uh, launching satellites in space has become cheaper, and people can make smaller satellites that do get the job done. So all of these data are migrating on the cloud, uh, and uh, they're becoming more accessible. Uh, 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 the software to look at the data is becoming open source. It used to be a technology transfer issue to share software. Um, and data mining using machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence techniques becomes uh, uh, more readily usable when all the data are on the cloud. Uh, the cloud, that means I don't even know if they're in Newport Library or somewhere else. They are somewhere in the cloud, but can access it from the same point. And you need um, some sort of new technology to get information from this data because the, the data amount is tremendous. I started my career manipulating data sets in the megabyte range. I had learned that to deal with, uh, uh, with more than megabyte, gigabyte, oh, gigabyte is cool. And now we have terabytes, and terabytes is becoming a little bit of a limitation. We're talking about para, petabytes. I don't even know the P for, I know it's 1,000 times bigger than terabyte. So it's an immense uh, increase in, uh, in data. So now I'm gonna show you an example of AI, or machine learning. So. Um, when I was at USC, I did a little bit of neural network, and, and I had a, a system that detected beads in flow and with a neural network machine, and I thought it was pretty cool. But I did not pursue my PhD on that. I uh, didn't feel like it was mature enough. And the networks that we had back in the 90s were, were okay. I never thought much about artificial neural network at that time, and things changed recently. In the past 10 years, suddenly these neural networks became super smart. They added more layers, uh, the training techniques got improved, and now we have ChatGPT, which is a fancy Google, but we have stuff that uh, can, make, uh, can make a difference in the way we look at this data. So uh, there was a student of uh, Isabella, a PhD student, who learned about this technology uh, on his weekend days. He was working on something else for his PhD. And, uh, um, it kind of asked me if there was something we could do with that. And I said, well, yeah, take some of this imagery and see if you can detect the position of the glacier fronts. That's something we don't like to do by hand. It's very cumbersome. So if you can have a machine do that. And he did that pretty quickly. Once we gave him the training data sets and, and the places to, to do that, he did that in a, in a few weeks. So then I took him to a more challenging problem, uh, which is to identify the grounding line. So this is a... Uh, an interferogram from radar that shows the differential motion of ice when it becomes a float in the ocean. So the ice shelf part on top is floating on the ocean and the grounded ice on the bottom is, is uh, grounded on the bedrock. And in between you have this transition boundary, beautiful fringes, right? I've been looking at these fringes for 30 years. I still love them. I think it's beautiful uh, measurement. I'm fortunate to look at that every day. And so we want to detect that transition boundary. And we try to do that analytically, uh, and it's, it's really cumbersome. Nothing really works well. So we end up do, doing it by hand. And when you do it by hand, you can do 10, 20, 30. 
But recently, we came to the point where we had to do that over thousands of images, and my students and postdoc refused to do the job. So I asked, uh, yeah, could, could, you, could you do it? And um, uh, that's, that's what he did with the deep learning uh, algorithm. Um, we analyzed uh, 20,000 interferograms, which were divided in 4 million tiles. Uh, when you do this machine learning uh, analysis, you spend a lot of the time just preparing the data sets that you want to analyze. And the machine learning algorithm is just a black box you put it in, and then you get what you want. And the scientist also has to define what you want, what's the end product. Uh, we spent several months preparing the data set, and he processed the data in a few weeks. Uh, and it worked really well. We applied it to the whole Antarctic. Um, 20 hours to do these 4 million tiles with machine learning versus a human expert would take 7,600 hours, and I don't have a student willing to do that yet. And um, by doing that, we, we found something quite interesting. We realized that this uh, grounding line, this transition boundary, migrates a lot more than what we thought. And we didn't see that before because we didn't have enough data to look at it. And now we could look at it repeatedly over time and over the whole Antarctic. And we found that uh, the water, the seawater, intrudes beneath the glaciers over kilometers instead of hundreds of meters. And we did not know that. And that's a game changer for uh, glaciology because that makes the glaciers more sensitive to the ocean. The fact that this water can percolate over kilometers beneath the grounded ice at high tide and bring heat. If the ocean gets warmer for any reason, it will influence a very big part of the glacier. The glacier will fill it and start to speed up. So we think this is the missing link between the current projection of ice sheet loss, which we think are too conservative, and what happened in the past. The missing link is the way the ocean interacts with the ice uh, uh, in that way. And so uh, at the AI techniques to like observe these very vast data sets, to detect boundaries, I put a green check mark. Is that a sort of thing that we already do? At the moment, um, it looks we can like also, there's a bit of echo in the high emission scenario. Yeah. Is it okay? At the moment, okay. it looks like oh, there's something on else going on high there. Emission scenario. Uh, we also and work on uh, reconstructing the, the bed beneath the ice sheets like using observations and model. High emission scenario. I'm going to talk a little bit yeah. about robotic exploration of, uh, of the, the polar moment, regions using AI. Like That's a red check mark because something we want to do, but scenario. we're not there yet. And, and then uh, combining AI the with moment, modeling, uh, something like Isabella will talk a little bit more in the context of water. So uh, if you want to know what I'm working on today, I'm still working on satellites heavily, thanks to NASA. But the thing that I'm most curious about is exploring caves. I'm going back to the caves, folks. <laughs> Ice cavities. Um, this is where the water is. Uh, this is an Antarctic glacier. They don't break into icebergs right away. They develop a floating section, which we call ice shelf. And this ice shelf can be a kilometer thick. We want to know what kind of water is underneath and what kind of seafloor. We want to know if the warm water can make its way all the way to the base of the glacier and melt it fast. If it does, then the glacier is very sensitive to the warmer water. You cannot send a ship there. You cannot even send a submarine. Submarines don't like to go in places like that when they cannot come to the surface. Uh, when you send a robot, it's really difficult to communicate with it using acoustic sources because the device will have to go 100 kilometers away, and nobody knows how to communicate over these distances to these robots. So it's really challenging. Another option is to drill a hole, hot water drill, through a kilometer of ice and launch instrument. But it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to drill a hole. It doesn't seem like a lot to drill a hole through ice, but when you have to drill a kilometer, 30 centimeter diameter, it's, it's quite a big job. So I'm going to take you um, to a part of Greenland where we develop this technology. Um, some of our technology is very uh, expensive, heavy, and cumbersome. Uh, so I wanted to develop something a little bit more portable. So we are here at our camp, uh, which we were in 2023 in May. We are on an ice shelf in a part of the ice shelf that broke apart. And it healed itself with the growth of sea ice. So this is our camp. And underneath, we don't know exactly how many meters of ice, but underneath is a deep ocean. 
Um, and we selected this place because we thought we could find easily an access hall for our instrument. This is our instrument. Uh, it looks like a torpedo. It weighs 25 kilos. It's operated by a small team. This is my lead engineer here working here. We're in a tent. It's minus 25 degrees C outside, and inside is zero degree. That's why you see a, a pool of water. So we have boots inside, and then we have polar gear outside. And this is a fiber optic tether uh, to stay in communication with the robot, because I told my engineers, I don't want to lose that thing. And when it collects data, I want the data right away, all right? Instead of hoping it comes back. Uh, so I'll have a little video of um, the team deploying this. So we have a, a little hole in the sea ice. It's only uh, about a meter deep. So it's very easy to get into the cavity. We're fortunate to have a film crew with us from uh, French TV. We uh, made a whole documentary on this. So this is our robot going down um, into the cavity. Um, this is another shooting. I think it has a little bit of uh, sound with it. Right. We didn't get to do that. The robot got to go underneath there and see what, what there is. I would love to go put my head in there, but uh, it's pretty cold. And we have to go 400 meters deep uh, to get our measurements. And that's not very good for scuba divers to go 400 meters deep. Uh, <clears throat> All right, and then you hear the little engines. It's not the scream of a whale. The rest is pretty boring because, yeah, it's a cavity. Uh, <clears throat> I have another uh, animation. Yes, here we go. This, this was made by the uh, French TV to explain a little bit the sort of measurements that we're doing. So our robot has this unique thing. It's the only one in the world that actually does that. It has a multi-beam sonar uh, uh, on the torpedo that can measure the depth of the seafloor and the bottom of the, the ice at the same time. So in a 360 degree uh, measurement. So this was the first time we deployed it. Prior to that, we deployed it in the lake in France. So it's quite a jump in, uh, in difficulty. And uh, everything worked well. We didn't lose the probe, that's number one. Um, uh, we did 11 dives up to four kilometers in distance. We found a seafloor that was 200 meters deeper than what we thought and super flat. There's absolutely no contrast in seafloor. It's full of sediments. And then we found a lot of interesting things at the base of the ice. We see the signature of the melt. We find some places where it's totally flat and there's absolutely no melt. And places where you have cliffs with very high melt. And none of that is visible at the surface. There's no surface expression of that, which shows the importance of looking at these processes from below, not from the surface. So we're quite excited about that. And we hope to take this instrument to, uh, back to Peterman and also in the Antarctic. Now, other systems exist. Commercial system, this is uh, the, the Huggin with uh, uh, my colleague Anna Wallin from Sweden. She took the Huggins to Twaits Glacier, one of the most important glaciers in Antarctic. Uh, that system weighs two and a half tons and costs $2 million. And you cannot uh, drive the software differently. It's commercially owned, so it's not open source. You cannot change the software any way you want. And in the last campaign, she lost it. Um, the robot went and never came back, and we have no idea what happened to the robot, what it decided to do or not do. So she has no more robot. On the right is IceFin, um, which is a robot similar to what we have, which was deployed at the Twaits in 2019, went to the ground line, collected data. Uh, the two PI of that team have been listed by Time Magazine, top 100 scientists of the year. So it was great, but there's no plan to go back again. That was it, that was a one-time thing. Cool, we got measurements, we saw it, and this international effort closed door and, and, and is done for now. Now the vision that we had, and uh, I've been working with JPL for quite a long time on this, is to put the technology that has been developed for the Mars rovers into these robots for autonomous navigation. With a tether, we can only go so far, we can only measure so much you need eventually robots that can navigate these vast expanses of unmapped terrain and come back and recharge and 
download the data and go again and again and again. You need smart technology for that. So we have that for Mars. And when we tried to work with the commercial operators of uh, uh, underwater vehicle, they said, uh, you, you can't touch our software. It's proprietary. It's a no-no. So um, we had to go back to square one. So to wrap up, um, I have a couple of um, my first two bullets are a little bit of a parallel situation. You know, the fact that uh, climate is changing rapidly, there's a lot of environmental degradation, we, we know that, but there's a lack of political action. A lot of people are talking about it on both sides of the Atlantic, but not much is being done. And um, right now, 2023 was a record warming year, and my colleagues at uh, NASA GIST tell me that uh, they see an increase in the rate of global warming in recent years rather than a decrease. Um, similarly, um, I may seem biased, but the polar regions are extremely important uh, to the rest of the planet, to sea level rise, but also on the climate system. And a lot of the federal budgets are operating on a flat basis. The budget of NASA cryosphere program, when I started in the late 80s, is the same today in actual dollars. It hasn't changed one bit. And that's not the fault of NASA. That's not, um, well, it's partly my fault for not explaining things more clearly, but we need to shift a little bit some of these priorities in order for scientists and modelers to get these observations, critical observations that they don't have in the next five years instead of the next 30 years. So there's a bit of parallel in how we adapt uh, the way we spend money, knowing that the cost of adapting to climate change, I mentioned in one of the slides, will be orders of magnitude right, bigger. I wrote an op-ed with an economist on the Yale Climate uh, Journal saying if you multiply the science budget for this by 10, if you can save even 10% of the cost of adaptation because you provide better science to policymakers, people who have to decide on how to adapt, it will more than repay itself. We cannot model what we cannot observe, right? I didn't say that, Lord Kelvin said that. Uh, we have a growing set of satellites I'm not overwhelmed by that. I'm super excited. When I started my career, we were joking around that we only use 10% of the satellite data collected. Today, we use every bit of it, 100%. And we go to the agencies and ask for more. We can deal with it. Um, what is a little bit missing for some of these institute observation is uh, robotic networks that inform us about what's happening in the polar regions. Um, I care about polar station with zero carbon signature. I work with the Belgium International Polar Station because it's the only station that has zero emission in the Antarctic. So as a scientist and caring for my climate, I don't want to cause more problems. So I care about going to the Antarctic with a low carbon emission. We want to develop robotic technology to do this so we have continuous measurements, but we also don't need to go back all the time to do these measurements ourselves. We have operating stations that can transmit the data, the satellite, uh, to help us out. All of that stuff will benefit from AI and machine learning techniques to help us ingest this hard volume of data, or in the case of robotic exploration, to build intelligent systems that can collect the observations we need to understand the climate system. And I thank you with that, and I'm going to pass it on to uh, Isabella, who will talk about another part of the climate system. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to take you on uh, another, another journey, like looking at how we can use AI to, you know, an observation from space to track water, and uh, what can we get from AI. So here is a little outline. I think uh, uh, I wanted to just, you know, as, as everybody, so what we are trying to see, we have climate models, which is what usually people are using, you know, we call dynamical physical model to understand how climate evolve. And then we have, what is the difference between those and AI and machine learning models? And then what are the opportunities and the challenges? I'm gonna just briefly talk about this. And then I'm going to talk about the power of observation. We learn from Eric, but you know, observation are amazing because they contain all the information about what is happening and what is happening is different from what happened in the past because of human have interact with climate and we're changing it. And so it doesn't change in it. And so how can we, 
do exploit all the information in the observation. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about forecast and say where we're standing for what we have up to now and talk about a new project that we have which just started, it is funded by the state of California. And I'm gonna show you some example of things that we're planning to do in California to try to improve uh, uh, how we understand the evolution of, of climate and make them forecast. So here we go. So if we wanted to compare what is a physical model, you know, with what is an AI model. So a physical model is basically aimed to, you know, represent in a detailed way physical processes. What are really the processes that move the dynamic within the Earth system? And they're like a mathematical equation is very complicated. When we look at the AI model, the AI model is really basically use a lot of statistic technique to try to capture what are the pattern and the relationship between, you know, in, within the observation and trying to capture this nonlinear relation, which basically are very complicated observation if they're nonlinear. You know, let's like try to see if we can get something that is not obvious. So uh, those are very two very different modeling approach, and uh, uh, so from the computational point of view, which means like how long does it take to do those calculations? Well, physical model takes a lot of time and a lot of more than time, a lot of resources because they're very complex. They need supercomputer. We have a lot of differential equation to solve. Uh, when we go to AI as an advantage, after we train the model and we develop an AI model, is actually much less expensive to simulate and look at the different application. And so we can just use and using parallel computer resources. So it can be very conveniently. The other thing that is very, you know, it's pretty good for, you know, that come from AI is that why, if you want to change, uh, you know, uh, adapt to new data, if we have a physical model, we have to change manually. What are the relationship, the physical relationship that connect the different uh, uh, the, the, the processes? While uh, if we have an AI model, we can easily adapt the model because we have a combination of pre-training and of mathematical equation. There is a, if you want a downside, which is like a, when we go and look at the interpretability of what we get from a physical model, we have physical process that are embedded there. And so we know what we get, you know, what the answer comes from, what is the physical process that we just represented. While in traditional AI, and this is like becoming, it's changing with more advanced AI, more modern AI, basically we get this relationship and we have to understand, you know, like we don't have an explicit process that causes those. So we have to interpret that and that can be like more challenging to interpret in terms of physical processes. So what are the opportunity of AIs? And so there are a lot of opportunity. One is the, you know, uh, we have a data-driven inside. So while the model that we have now are great model, we have great climate model, they make great improvement. However, we don't have a perfect understanding of all the processes that occur on our planet and they explain all what we are observing. And they're very complex. And, uh, the, the, but the observation, the real data, they measure those processes. And so there is information in the data that we can leverage. And so the idea is that can we use machine learning and AI to extract this information, information and you know, make those improvements. Uh, the other thing that AI offer a very good opportunity is that we can combine very different, different observations. We can go from observation that are coming you know, from remote sensing, from ground uh, you know, based or in situ measurement, from, uh, you know, uh, also observation from a platform, like, like from like a, a, a from a social network. It's like information to solve a problem. And I'm gonna just address a little bit this later. later. And the, the other thing that is very, is very nice and we can really count is the scalability. We can scale the problem. We have a model, the model has some grid cell. They're very defined to downscale, takes a lot of work. For AI, we have a lot of metrics, multiplication, so we can do the downscaling, so we can have a very convenient way. Of course, those are all, you know, basically, they can lead to improving the performance. They're also challenging, so it's not like, you know, it's not like, the challenges are, first, we don't have, the, the real data are, you know, are complicated. 
We don't have continuous data. They are imperfect. They are gappy. We have data for some period. We don't have like all continuous data. And the other thing is that this AI machine, you know, we, you know, is, is this a black box? How do we interpret? The, how we know what we put? When we talk about again an AI model, we are talking about a system of equation, statistical equation. And uh, what I think, and I want to say, is that one key when we have these big challenges in AI. So AI is not going to necessarily substitute a human. You need human and you need us to understand. You need people that understand the data and the processes to work with the people that understand the AI technology and develop together a model. Because especially when you have data that are not perfect, if you have like tons and hundreds of data, and Eric was talking before about training, we have to train our model to make sure that that's what we do. Sometimes we don't have all this training, so we have to be very clever and be able to use it. So I do think that there is a lot of potential for AI when you combine people that are really good at AI with people that are very good at understanding the processes and understand the question. OK, so here I'm going to go back and I do a step back and I'm just going to talk about the power of observation. So those are some data. These are like GRACE data. GRACE is a, is a couple of satellites. We have like a couple of missions since 2002. And you can measure uh, basically change in mass of the Earth system. And basically, we are weighting the Earth. And this is, a uh, this is a map that shows you how, you know, this is the mass change from one month to the other. And you can see there is like, a, you can see like the, the monsoon cycle. And again, this is like two satellites that are orbiting 200 kilometers uh, apart, 400 kilometers higher up in the sky. And looking at the changes in distance between those two satellites, which we can measure with a better than a micron per second, which is the size of my hair or a blood cell, we can figure out how the mass is changing on land. And, uh, and so we have this observation and a lot of other observation. And I'm just going to show you another. And again, this information include all the processes that are changing due to our you know, contribution, how climate is changing. They are not necessarily perfectly represented in model. So this is another example. And this is a combination. So on the left, we have a precipitation observation. So this is like from satellite. We have satellite that tell us how much rain comes. And here we have basically precipitation deficit from sustained dry event. Dry event that continues. And this is between 2003 and 2009. So this tells us how much less precipitation we got in this period, you know, for, but we don't know what's going on on the land. And so if we combine with other data set, in this case, oh, in this case is why with the GRACE data, this gives us an information about the total water storage on land. So we can just understand how much of this deficit is mapping into less water gets stored on land. And you can see like, you know, you have different, and I, oh, oh, here we go. You can have different parts. So we need both observation. And so the myriad of satellite data and also ground observation are really important to paint a picture of what is happening on our planet. Okay, I'm going to go a step back and go back uh, and talk about AI and show some success of AI. And in this case, we are talking about weather prediction. Now, weather, when we talk about their weather, weather concern between changes that go from you know, 7 to 14 days. So short time scale. And we actually do pretty good about, you know, with weather. And here are two examples. This is cyclone tracking. And this is atmospheric river. Everybody has heard about atmospheric river. We got like our tax deferred last year because we had some big atmospheric river and caused so much flooding. And that was a, like a big deal. But what we see, the black line represent what the model, those dynamic or physical model can tell us. You know, and this is like, Again, in advance, how we do it, oh, I don't see my, well, lead time, you know, a few days. And the blue line shows you what you get if you use basically a high AI method. So we can beat the model. We can do better and, you know, but again, 
And the same things here is uh, for atmospheric river on the right. So for being able to predict in ahead. And of course, we want to predict this ahead because you know, we're going to be prepared when we have flood, you know, because people that do agriculture want to know if they have to deal with relocating water or figure out you know, what to do with like this. And, and so, so they're doing pretty well, you know, if, if you want. And we're doing not so bad, although there is like a lot of improvement. But AI shows up that it's beating. Now, I want to go back and talk about when we talk about forecast. So we talk about forecast, there are different scale of forecasts. Weather is what is easy. And I say easy because a concern was about, you know, for a few hours, which is called now cast, to about seven days and uh, up to two, two, two weeks. And here on the right side, you have like, it shows you what are the forecast skills. How good is this forecast? And so this forecast is pretty good initially. And then it really roughly go down. We're just losing the ability. You know, we do much poor job when we want to go closer to the 14 days. Then there is like, what is the forecast? Seasonal to sub-seasonal forecast. I'm going to call it S to S. And this combined weather and climate and is very complicated because after 14 days, you know, we have the, the weather become chaotic. And we have to combine things. On the other hand, it's very important because to make decision for stakeholder, bro, both like at the state level, so you know what is the allocation of resources for, you know, like for next year for water allocation of funding to just like or for agriculture, how well, we can we decide? You know, we want to know a few months ahead what we can, you know, what we what are availability, and so as you can see here. For the sub seasonal, which is about between uh, two weeks and 60 days, and the seasonal forecast is like between 12 and 14 months, we have very low skill, very difficult problem. And then we have this other, you know, seasonal to decadal forecast, longer scale. But, you know, so part of what I want to talk to you about is some work that we want to do in trying to see can we just get in improvement in understanding this shorter scale and again not just because they're interesting because as really an impact on everybody life and making decision so here i'm just going to put some of the challenges in this so there are uh, challenges there like uh, so uh, there is a most of the funding federal funding has been allocated for weather of climate long climate uh, time scale like a, a few hundreds year you know, more than the cattle. Uh, it's also not very easy. And I should just put this in a more positive way. You know, it's like basically, uh, I think that there is a lot, of, a lot of potential in academic to be able to work with stakeholder and, uh, you know, with applied science community. We solve problem. We want to solve problem that people can actually, and, and you know, have answer that people can use and apply and make changes in their life and decision that they're making. And there are no very, it's not easy to have connection between what has been done from the side of the research with what are like the real end users. So, you know, in, in, in this project, we have the Department of Water Resources, one of our end users, but we have been talking with, uh, you know, different stakeholders from water district to some uh, uh, commodity uh, and, uh, you know, and, and planners. But the point is like you need, and I just want to frame this in, the, in this context that we need all this help. When we want to use AI and we want to use observation, we need all this, in, this energy, this uh, entity to interact together to be able to better constrain the, the problem. And then, of course, there is a lack of uh, you know, outreach. So what I'm doing now, you know, and uh, you know, hopefully I'm going to do it well enough, and please, Tell me that you didn't understand what I told you and ask me question after because the point is like how can we communicate and is me I have to be good enough to be able to convey to you what I'm doing but also I have to understand what are the different end user need you know and, and see how I can package what I come up with and uh, and then of course what is very important is having interdisciplinary uh, group so scientists working with stakeholders with end user with policy maker because if i'm just the scientist I solve the problem i solve my problem and then i don't have the application and it cannot be used in practice to just you know and and it can be like doesn't you know is a is a is, is a challenge but i think is is key for what we want to do okay so 
this is like the challenges. So if you look at the seasonal to sub-seasonal forecast, technical challenges are, and again, we are, we are talking about uh, short, you know, short term you know, uh, this decision, but decision like, uh, I'm gonna show you an example after, but NOAA produces some of the, the data. We have daily, we have weekly, we have monthly, and we have yearly information. And what they're based from a technical point of view, basically, the scientists come up, the people, they, they're, and they're like, very big group of people, both on the uh, physical, you know, science model development and on the AI, they're working on this, but they're developing those. They're trying to find what are called like predictor. What are some indices that can tell us what is happening? And El Nino is something that's familiar to, I assume, everybody. You know, when we just, I, I remember I was looking, what is a good El Nino year so I can go ski? And we were waiting, and it's gonna be good, it's gonna be good, and at the end, it's like, it's not gonna be as good. You know, and so we understand the physics of the process in principle. However, we cannot exactly predict where it's going to come, and so that's a challenge. And there are like other observation and other, you know, other variabilities like North American Os Atlantic Oscillation, and and so one of the challenges that the the predictability. So what we you know the, what we call the predictor, what we want to use to make the prediction. Uh, they are not perfectly understood. We would like to understand them better, and uh, they are not perfectly represented in the model, in the climate model, in the dynamic of the physical model. So can we use AI, because we have observation now, more and more observation, to get better handle on this, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and get better estimate? And so this is an example of one of the end users. So this work that we're doing is funded by the, the, uh, by the state of California. And one of our end user is the Department of Water Resources. And I literally went to talk to those people and say, okay, what should I do? You know, there's a part of the work that is like being as a scientist. What should I do that is gonna be useful for you? What should I do and what does it take for you to believe that what I did as a scientist, you know, is useful and you trust me? So what are the metrics? And this is very important. And this is the Department of Water Resources, but they're like, so among you, there may be a lot of people that can see application of this and they can think about. And my point is like, I would love to hear from you and think about how can we make those products. And so the Department of Water Resources, this is what they're looking for. Usually in December, at the end of fall, they wanna make decision about allocation of resources for the next year. They wanna know what's happening in January and what's happening the next year. And there is a lot of allocation of funding. And then, you know, and so this is like, they would like to know again in January, in December or the end of October, what did happen in January. And then again, on March 1st, there is like, a, you know, they are like the typical Central Valley project initial allocation, you know, so how water resources get distributed. And they would like to know what happened, you know, at a few months scale. And that's like critical, but the same things in agriculture, you know, the people that have to decide, are we gonna, you know, they wanna know, are we gonna have like flooding? So can we just put seeds, you know, like, or should we rent, you know, machine to just uh, collect the crop by some date? And this, they have to plan it in advance. And so this is like, and so what are they having now? And this is a map of the historical skills. It's like how good historically the seasonal outlook are, you know, and basically when you see white, it means that the skills are very poor. And what this tells us, tells us that, you know, and, and for scientists, this is good. I'm sorry, it's a good problem. You have to think how to solve it. So if you look, skills are pretty good in Florida, but we don't care because we live in California. And, <laughs> California is actually very challenging. And because if we are close to the boundary with the mountain, we are close to the ocean, we have very different topography, it's very complicated. So, you know, but, so how do we get, how do we improve this ability? You know, how do we move in the right direction? And there is again, a lot of work done to do this. And this is what we are thinking uh, the, the is, gonna be, is gonna be helpful because most of the effort they are going on now, they are like done at the scale of the, in, of the United States or global scale. So people have to just you know, run a model that satisfy the entire US. So they cannot be hyper specific. Or even if you look at California, it's gonna be like, okay, let's look at California, the entire California. How do we adapt just a model? They have a big scale smaller to California, and then they have to think what are the parameters. So what we, we do in this project, what I really believe is an important 
you know, contribution. We want to put together the observation. I'm an observation person. I understand very well the observation, the limitation, what I can get. But I need to work with people They are stakeholders. They understand, you know, I have to understand what they're needing, what product I can give to them. And at the same time, I have to work with very good people. They understand the AI, but I cannot give them the data. I need to work with them to build together, you know, a model. And so part, you know, what we think we can, we can leverage on the physical processes, the dynamic model, the physical model, and, you know, and use a data-driven and a user, you know, also user-driven, you know, approach to develop and improve model at the, at the local scale. So specifically from some region in California. And it's not going to be for entire California. It's going to be something modular. It means that I'm going to develop it for some specific area. And then I can apply somewhere else. And I have to make some adjustment because the processes are not going to be the same. And the uncertainty, the ideal, and the user need are not going to be the same. So I'm going to embed in my AI model also what you know, a variable that tells you know, the constraint and give more weight to some user need in that location. So it's going to be hyper specific, and it's going to be is a continuous. So there's been a lot of learning about so this is a new project we just started, and learning of you know how do we connect all those different fields, interdisciplinary fields. So this is an example, uh, some initial results. So what we have to do, we have to understand what's going on, and the observation can tell us what's going on. So the only thing that I wanted you to take in this figure is like this is a comparison between the number of extreme events in uh, in 1982, 1992, so like using some observation, and 2012, 2022. And you can see where it's darker, we have more extreme events in precipitation. You can see that in Northern California and in the Sierra, we have a clear increase in the extreme event, in extreme precipitation. And then what we did, we went to look at the distribution. It means like you can just distribute, you can just calculate all the events in this period and you can plot them and you can see how they get distributed with respect to the mean. And if you look the distribution in the Northern California and the Sierra between the red one is like 82, 92 and 2012, 2022, we see that the tail is much bigger in the most recent year. So the observation, so we start from the observation, we see what the observation, we're going to build this AI model based on the observation, and we're going to have an AI model that is going to be a function of what are like the, the processes locally. So we're not going to have a model that's going to be the same for the entire California, but we're going to look at specific area in California and see how we can solve, we can, we can improve this. And uh, this is another example. Uh, so to do this, what we do, and this is like, so there is something that is called in AI, it's called foundational AI. Basically, it's something, a very generic model that can be, that has been trained, has been tried on a lot of very different products. And so what we take, we just, we, we, so we are coming to this very humble. There are people that have been working on this for a long, long time, but we, we know that there's been like some challenge in being able to zoom in on the local and look at the local application. So we took some model that someone of those you know, very smart people have developed, and this is one of the models. We use it as a sandbox. Basically, uh, what you want to see here, we just use this model, and we try to look at the you know, uh, uh, prediction of temperature. And the, what you want to take home is that if the top figure look the same, we did a good job, basically. And this is in representing what is the fourth day, you know, 14 days benchmark. How can we represent, you know, 14 days for a car? And then there's some skill associated to that. So now what we're going to do, we're going to take this and we're going to personalize. That's what you say in, in, in AI. We're going to personalize the model. We're going to add some additional feature so they can work much better for California and can solve some practical problem in California. And this is like a... You know, with this I'm concluding, I think that, you know, tracking water resources and making a seasonal to sub-seasonal forecast is a very big challenge, uh, especially locally. And now because, uh, you know, because, again, is a problem that's been dealt at the global scale, at the scale of all the U.S., but we need, you know, there's a lot, lot of more work, there's a lot of more potential that can done, be done locally. Uh, 
there we are at a very good point to make this step because we have a huge number of observation as Eric was showing before we have a lot of satellite observation and the observation contain the information also is a good time because uh, we can now use a 40 year average to tell what happened you know compare what happened this year and see what happened next because things are changing and they're not constant in time and so this is like a, there, there is a you know and so there is a, a there is also emerging AI technology the AI just made big product progress in doing so uh, AI can help by combining observation and physical model at the local scale uh, I think it's very important to have scientists they understand the processes together they they understand the observation with stakeholder and embed that you know because we want to find the company how we can push you know I can get that information and uh, uh, we're doing this in California we just start targeting sub region and this is a working project but I see in progress but I think there is a lot of potential Thank you guys very much. Um, that was really fascinating to, uh, I'd like to see somehow how the, the glacier connects to the, to the waterfall. Um, anyways, we have some time for questions. So I'm gonna open it up to the audience and I just ask that the questions be questions rather than statements. So <laughs> I'll go with you. Yes. Uh, the gentleman uh, who presented first, uh, Oh, thank you. Okay, for Dr. Rino, yeah. Yeah, who you presented first. You mentioned that uh, you showed a picture of the of the Mars rover, and you said that NASA was not going to cooperate, or the folks that were handling the rover were not going to cooperate with data. Is it was that it was something about the data sharing or something with with the? I think that I think the question was uh, the implication was that the the people making the submarines weren't allowing you into the data into the software to to you wanted to use the Mars rover technology but yeah. you couldn't apply it to the yeah, submarines it apply, because the yeah. people who make the underwater vehicles oh so it doesn't have a closed apply. system it was because I was thinking you, if you're working with NASA and NASA's Mars, where is the conflict? But if you're saying that it's not applicable, it's, it, what you're saying? Is that true? Is the people yeah. who make the UAVs have a, shut, have a closed system? Well, you know, these, these UAVs have a lot of technologies. They, they have a lot of value, and, and these companies are not in the business of, of, of working with um, academia or research institute who tell them we can make this better, a lot smarter than your dumb AUV. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, it's just something that's going to take time before we see down the line the commercial benefits of doing that. If, if we had a lot of customers coming to their door and said, we're not happy with your autosub, we want a little bit more intelligence built in it, and these guys at JPL have all the stuff ready for you, maybe they'll, they'll make their move. The, the main field right now for these AUVs is not to take it under uh, an ice shelf in, in the Antarctic. They have other needs for the global oceans where they don't necessarily need that technology. So we have to convince them to do that. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. All right, next. Yeah, so when there's, let's go ahead. Thank you. Um, now I have a question about the whole uh, AI modeling for California specifically for you, Professor. Um, would you, like, so you mentioned like you are starting this research on sub-regions within California. Can you hypothetically predict vintages in regions such as Napa Valley to predict outcomes of rainfall, say, to determine like whether the vintage is going to be prevalent or is going to be successful for a vineyard? I'm not in the wine business, but I'm somebody who wants a steady wine. Yeah. To the, I drink wine on a <laughs> basis. So I want to know, scientifically, if you're going to have like weather forecasts, can you predict the outcome of what the grapes are going to be, but also ultimately whether it's going to be a great opportunity for a vineyard owner to predict on how to, one, irrigate their vineyard, yeah. but also how to predict how to save money so they can ultimately pass that on to the consumer. So I, that, that would be the goal. And I do think that there is potential in doing, being hyper-specific, and you know, I would love to talk to you do more, you know, exactly. What are, you know, and part of us is like we're going to build a model there's a modular model so we can apply in a specific area but it's going to build in a way that can be applied in different area but the goal would be to try to improve our ability to predict you know what is going to happen with precipitation or with drought and so that is going to help uh, you make decision in terms of like exactly 
what to do and you know how, how to plan for your crops. That that we we, we think that there is a and, and you know I'd say we had a handful of stakeholders that believe and people. So we are coming in a, in a field where there are like a lot of people that are doing a lot of work. Uh, I believe the uh, hyper specific city and the fact that you know this that what we are doing is new and has not been done because people are being you know concerned with just doing things at more of the global scale and the scale of the U.S. So I believe that we can do make progress that way. Okay, thank you. Sorry, another one over here. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, I just. I'm in the middle of reading a March 4th New Yorker, I know this is a little bit of a statement before the question, on um, solar storms and the effect on, you know, the blackouts from solar storms and are, as we get more and more satellites and scientists are depending more and more for the satellites and the cloud and all, is there any discussion or concern about these superstorms, solar superstorms that have the potential of knocking out satellites, data, you know, the the. Uh, I didn't quite understand all the articles, so I'm not sure. Yeah, why I my didn't read the article. Not. I didn't read the article. There's another article in the New York Times uh, talking about the surge in in demand for electricity. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's a real concern. So. Yeah, uh, I've there's read a risk down the line that too. we cannot meet our yeah. electricity demand, and we're going to have to build more yeah. uh, plants burning fossil fuel to meet that demand because we need more electricity for cars, right. for our phones, for all kinds of things. This is next year's spotlight yeah. on science topic, so, actually. So. so March, stay tuned. At our library or at the UCI library, look for the March fourth this year uh, New Yorker art, New Yorker and. It's page 26. <laughs> <laughs> Very specific. But, but I want to say there, there's a lot of work. When we have those satellites going, there's a lot of attention to look at the solar cycle and how the solar cycle can affect the different observation and how affect the energy because, you know, those satellites have solar panel and they can have an impact of the energy. So this is all taken into account when, you know, in the people that launch the satellite and they look at the maneuver. So it's, it's going to be accounted and plays an important role. Yes. Um, you'll be up at night after you we're trying not to terrify people. Okay, that's not our that's not our objective. Okay, I have a question here. Does NASA share its data with other countries, and do other countries that are NASA-like share data with us? Is there collaboration? Yeah, NASA. I think that one of the beautiful things that NASA does is that all the data collected are shared with the community and so can be used you know, by all scientists in the world. So if you want tomorrow, you can get up and go look at what happened and the water storage you know, from, you know, from those two satellites that were showing or a lot of other, you can just have information about the ice flow and you can do it from your desk. And we have a similar relationship with like uh, the European community and other agency. And in fact, that's very important in being able to support this observation system to be able to have, uh, you know, international collaboration, to be able to support also the, you know, like all those missions and this data system that which we want to maintain, we want to maintain to be able to monitor what's happening. Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, but the response varies depending on the country. So NASA and ESA are well ahead of that. Uh, they pursuing their goal of open data, you know, this is federally funded programs. It needs to go back to the public. That has been in the mandate of these agencies from day one. Uh, other agencies are not as proactive, and I'm not going to name any countries in particular. And sometimes it's not that they don't necessarily want to do it. They, they're not organized to do it. They don't have the structure to do it. And, and so they learn from the trailblazers at NASA and ESA. Yes, there was a discussion about the sea rise of one meter. What is the predicted time frame on that? How, how long? Uh, that's the trillion dollar question. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. Um, 
what we're working on right now is, uh, I mean, we, you have IPCC projections, right? And, and these projections um, are affected by the quality of the models that are used for that, and they're also affected by what humans are going to do to the system. It's just, you know, there's errors in the model, and there's even more uncertainty about we, uh, how are we going to respond to that. Um, for ice sheets, a, a number of us are convinced that these projections are too conservative, they're too low, they don't have all the physical processes in place that we're seeing happening in the ice sheets. So I'll give you just a bell part. Uh, we think we're off by a factor two, and, and I think the last few years, I think, I think I understand why we're off by a factor two and how we can rectify it. But one meter, we're on, we're on course for that, but it, it, it could be more than a meter. It's not going to be two meters, but it's going to be more than a meter. But the time frame, when you say more conservative, does that mean sooner or later? I mean, to, to put that frame of reference, if you predicted a 2050 and now it's 2030? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult question. So the, 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 big, the big uncertainty about the ice is the nonlinearity of the ice with climate forcing. Nothing is linear in a piece of ice sheet that collapses in a warmer climate. All the records from the past show that you start melting the ice slowly and it goes faster and faster and there's some points where it breaks apart and there's very little left. We don't know enough today to tell you there's a threshold right here that we're going to break, uh, we're going to pass and, and, uh, and, and then the, the process will go much more rapidly. I always say we're good at um, identifying thresholds once we pass them. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I have two questions. One is for Eric. Uh, based on buoyancy differences between cold and, and hot water, why would you expect to have a hot front underneath on the bottom of the ocean in these caves? Uh, Unless there's a geothermal... Why is the cold water on the top why, and the why is hot, it, yeah, hot water below? In the why case? are you looking for hot water? Oh, below. That's a good question. Well, the hot water should not be at the bottom, right? Right, unless you have a geothermal gradient or some activity below well, it, that. Well, it stays at the bottom because it's salty, right? So in California, we have warm, fresh water at the top and cold, salty water at the bottom. In the polar regions, you have a very, very cold climate at the top and there's melt at the top, so it's fresh and cold at the top, and you have salt and warm at depth. So the salt makes it stable at depth. All right, very good. And for Isabel, uh, regarding these models that you're planning to run or prepare for California, uh, you're using all the information, whatever data is available within the state. Are you also including some boundary effects from the you know, uh, other events happening outside coming into your model or you're going yeah. to restrict your boundaries? No, no, it's going to be important. So if we want to look at some so we need to understand also what happened in the, in the state close, you know, close by, of course. But then we want to be hyper-specific to what is happening in some location. The other thing that is very important, we want to make sure to, you know, we can, we, to, Co to corner the problem in what our stakeholder, what is the need in some specific area. So we're going to solve, try to solve for a specific problem that affect that area, which may be slightly different. And, you know, it may be some problem for, so when I go and talk to the Department of Water Resources, they tell me what I really need, you know, is a few months ahead. And uh, I need, uh, if I have information about big area, for example, if, I, if you can just show me that you can just get much better result for Northern California, Southern California, maybe the Montal area and the, uh, the Colorado River, then that's a result for me. But another stakeholder, which could be, you know, the, you know like the different water district of some, you know, people, you know, some grower, may have different need. So the, the idea is like, can we just optimize and then start from something that shows that this has more potential. Thank you. I have one question. Um, yesterday on the LA Times front page was an article about sea ice and going have through a whole season without sea ice so the poor polar bears have to swim the whole time. Um, but it did mention the ability potentially for sea ice to recover, but uh, maybe you could make a comment about sea ice versus ice sheets and, and the ability or inability to recover. Uh, that's a good point, yes. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good point, Randy. Uh, sea ice and ice sheet is very different, right? Sometimes they're confused in the media. They call it ice cap. And I'm like, ice cap? What does that mean? Um, yeah, the sea ice is more reactive. It's a meter thick. The glacier ice is a kilometer thick. Uh, okay. So uh, the sea ice can rebound very quickly from one season to the next. That's actually a vehicle for rapid climate change, the sea ice cover. If you suddenly have very little sea ice cover uh, in the northern hemisphere, it can impact the ocean, it can impact ocean currents, and then you start uh, to change state. For the ice sheets, the response time is much longer, uh, much longer than that. Uh, so now you mentioned the Arctic sea ice. The one I'm worried about the most right now is the Antarctic sea ice, because since 2016, it started to collapse. And none of the models have predicted that. And this, um, it's taking the scientific community by surprise. We, we're not quite sure why it happened so quickly. And if it does recover, does it, I mean, if the sea ice can recover a little bit, does that then help nudge the effects of all the, the trauma to the ice sheet there? Yeah, yeah. Well. Uh, the, the, the two are connected. I mean, the, the lack of sea ice cover uh, uh, warms up the ocean in the summer. It, it, it cools it in the winter. So it's it, you know, because in the winter, if you cover the ocean with uh, sea ice, then it, it, it stays warm. If you remove the sea ice, then all that warmth is, is, is getting in the air. So it's, 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 it's complex. You know, the whole system is interacting. But what's happening to the sea ice has an impact on the ice sheets. And vice versa, the melting of the ice sheet in the ocean, sending all this fresh water in the ocean is also affecting the growth of the sea ice. Okay, any other questions? I think we're done. I have one final question. Where is the skiing gonna be best next year? Lake Tahoe or Utah? Tahoe, oh, look at the skiing. I don't know, we'll let you know soon. Okay, now there's, there's a real world problem. Let's thank our speakers again once tonight. Please join us for coffee and a cookie to talk, uh, have some more conversation, and please mark your calendars for May 15th for our next presentation. Thank you and good night. <laughs>